What's up, YouTube? This is a video write-up for the challenge, A Tour of X86, Part 1 from Seesaw CTF in the reversing category. It says, noobs only, and it gives us a netcat command to connect to a remote service, and a lot of files to download. All we need for Part 1 is this Stage 1 ASM. If you wanted to, you can W get it, but I already have it downloaded in my current directory. Um, so we could actually just go ahead and view it in a Sublime Text Editor, Stage 1 ASM, and I've got my Patreon supporters given here, but I also want to display it. Uh, I went ahead and downloaded a package to install package like NASM x86. Um, and it's not displayed now if in package controller in Sublime Text, but if you wanted better x86 or assembly syntax highlighting, that's a cool package to download and uh, kind of d make these comments and the code a little bit more readable here. So this challenge is, as it says, for people that are not used to reverse engineering, and that's okay. Uh, I fall in that category. So the netcat command that you actually end up running is essentially going to ask you questions about this code. And it takes a little bit for this connection timeout stupid delay, um, and that's very annoying. So what I'm going to end up doing actually is keeping track of the questions that were asked here in another text editor. So I'm just going to say nano answers.txt because these questions will remain the same, um, but maybe we'll time out of the connection. So we'll be able to just pump the answers into Netcat as we learn them and as we explore. So the first question is, what's the value of DH after line 129 executes? And it's one answer with one byte hex value pre prefix with zero X, just as you would expect to see hexadecimal. So hopefully I will balance between this is beginner friendly, newbie oriented, and something that a little bit more seasoned person with assembly can understand. Um, this goes through and explains how NASM is the essentially I don't I don't want to say compiler but that's probably the best word for it um, for assembly uh, from yes the assembly code that we're looking at dot ASM script files with opcodes and hexadecimal instructions um, essentially to a compiled binary so Kimu is what they would run the operating system they're making on blah 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 a texture is what they're working terminal etc so unnecessary stuff that you need to read through. Um, if you wanted to just jump to the answer here, you straight up can. Uh, what it goes through and initially does in the start label here that it tries to explain for you, it will uh, set EAX, essentially the register, the extended A register for 32-bit, um, all of those to be zero, in that EAX is 32 bits. I'll try and draw this out. EAX is 32 bits while AX is the last 16 of it. And then AL and AH are the high or low versions of, or the last eight bits of whatever 16 bits components that we're working with. So EAX is 32 bit, AX is the uh, lower, I believe, 16 bit, and then AH and AL are the higher bits, AH for higher, and AL for lower, both of those being 8 bits. They're all under that register, but they are just different components of it, different segments of it. You can see the split here between AH and AL. So. All of these are being set with the move instruction MOV to zero in Intel syntax. So AH is going to be zero, AL is set to zero, so is AX, all of it in this case. Let's remove all that. Hopefully that explains it a little bit better. They do the same thing with BX, BLBH, and that is the register for EBX, another register that you'll see in 32-bit assembly. Same thing with ECX, etc., etc. And eventually we're getting to question one. So question one, there are other ways to make a register be set to zero. I hope you know your binary operators and or not XOR and complements, etc. So in this case, when they are XORing a value with another value, if they XOR the same value on both ends of the operands, that XOR is an exclusive OR. So the XOR operation, when it takes an inputs, it's going to be a 
let's say a true table here, if we had inputs 0, 0, and an output on the other side, 0, 1, output on the other side, 1 and 0, output on the other side, and 1 and 1, output on the other side here, it's an exclusive OR. So that means that if these two are different, if one is not the other, this will return true. So in this case, 0, 0, both of them are the same value, so that's going to return 0. 0 and 1, well, one is different than the other, it's exclusive OR, that's going to return true, that's going to return true. But 1 and 1, or no matter what the value is, if they are the same value, it will return true. So, I'm sorry, it will, it will return 0, it will return false in this case. So, when you're doing this with an XOR, if you use, in, in an assembly, if you XOR one register or one component with itself, it essentially sets that whole register to 0. So that answers our first question. When we have to display this in a hexadecimal format with one byte, that byte is, again, uh, just two hexadecimal characters here. So if we wanted to say 0 as our answer, we would say 0x00, zero zero zero, and that would be the bytes that we're working with. So we have uh, lost connection and timed out just like that, but if we wanted to keep track of this answer, we could say 0x00. Zero zero zero. Perfect. Now, when we're asked this question, if I were to answer with something wrong, I'm going to give it the correct answer for this time, so it'll move on to the next question, but if I were to answer it something wrong, it would just crap out and we would lose our connection. So that's fine. Now we can move on to the next question. Now that we know that we can use our answers that we're working with so far and move on to the next question, now that we know it, what's the value of GS, what other variable or assembly notion here, after line 145 executes? Let's check out the code again. Moving down, moving on down. I don't know why I had an accent there. <laughs> that was weird. Some other operands and other things going. Jump not equal. We'll jump to another label. However, we're comparing if dx is equal to 0, which right now we originally had dx set to hexadecimal 0x fffff. But once we've knotted it, if you wanted to, that will go ahead and invert everything back to 0 again. So since compare dx equal to 0, that is equal, we're not going to end up jumping to that death label because the instruction is jump not equal to. But in our case, we are equal to. So that's fine. Let's move on. We're not going to end up jump taking this jump. We'll keep moving along literally in a procedural fashion. Looks like it's setting more questions here. It says, question two, gs is going to equal dx. Well, we've just discussed, dx is now being set to all zeros. Once we've set it to 0x fffff, and then we knotted it, that register or that value, again, is just being set to the proper evaluation of this. So when we take 0x fff and we knot it, all those proper bits, all those one bits, or all those things that are set to a value in a bit notion, so binary 0 or 1, once we've knotted them, they're all going to go to 0. So in this case, gs is set equal to dx, and dx is already equal to 0. So the next answer is 0x00 zero 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 again. Okay, cool. We can keep moving on now. Many of these registers actually have names, but they're mostly irrelevant and just legacy. So sp is a stack pointer. BP is the base pointer, SI source index. And what is this next question asking us? Let's get to the same answers we've had so far. What is the value of SI after line 151 executes? Answer with a two byte hex value, prefix with 0x. So we know that SP is set to CX. And where is CX set? Well, and do we see it anywhere else? Oh, just at the very top here. Before that code ran, CX was set to be 0. And then we set SI to equal SP. And SP is set to CX. So that means that following through this, SI is going to equal 0. But it wants it in 2 bytes. So we will have to answer 0x0000. Zero 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 zero. 2 bytes in this case. Perfect. What's the value of AX after line 169 executes? Again, 2 byte hex value, prefix of 0x. So now we're on line 169, and we're in a new function, a different label here. 
It's not really a new function since white space enables are effectively ignored in assembly, but we're labeling it so they can keep track of it as the original programmer. That's fine. So this function is supposed to print text. First things first, we need to set up the screen such that I will allow us to display text. So those are interesting things that would happen on the actual operating system or that KeyMu. However, step two, a problem, we can only print one letter at a time. So we're setting AL to one character, T, and move AH to 0x0E, zero zero question four. Okay, we know that 169 value of AX is going to equal as we saw in our description earlier, AX is 16 bits here. And AL and AH are the smaller parts of it. So AH for higher bits, AL. And AL is set to T. And AH is set to 0X, 0E. So what is the value of t in hexadecimal? Well, we can use Python to figure that out or anything else that we'd like to here. Let's use Python and let's use t as a character. Let's take the ordinal value of that so we know what it is in the ASCII table and let's go ahead and convert that to hex. Looks like it's 74. So if we were to put these together, we now have 0x0e Again, that's AH, as we can see in the assembly here. And now T is going to be 0x74 as that character in hex. Since it's all put together, since it's AH as both AH, I'm sorry, AX as both AH and AL, we're going to end up having 0x0e74. So let's go ahead and send that. And we'll keep track of that as our next answer. What is the value of AX after line 199 executes for the first time? So let's scroll down coming down here. Looks like we are setting AX to string to print, which we've defined just here as a database or some data here, ACOS, and we're printing it one character at a time when we call print string. So when we're getting to line 199, it's asking us what's the value of AX after this line executes. Well, we know that AX is being put in as our register. And that register is what's essentially being passed in as a parameter to this function here, print string, where we always, it says, I'm going to just pass the first parameter of a function through AX. And what we do, since we're ending up uh, just saying AX is going to equal string to print, and we jump to print string, since string to print starts with an A and we're going one character at a time, we know that the very, very end of AX is going to be what it was just before, just before we've, we've actually ran to this function. And then we're going to end up having that last, or that, that least significant bit, or that least significant byte in this case, set to the first byte of what we're trying to print out. So if we had, let's say, 0E to begin with, and then we end up working with an A character, what's the value of A in hexadecimal? Again, let's get Python. Let's get the ordinal value of A, lowercase a, convert that to hex, and we've got the value 61. So our nano answers now should be, the last question should be answered as 61. Let's go ahead and I totally removed my Netcat connection. Crap. Once we connect to it, let's go ahead and cat the answers right into it. So it should be able to just take everything that we've answered line by line and pump it through the actual socket and connection that we've made here. It'll be as if we entered the answers line by line and we're going through it manually. So awesome. That is how we solve that challenge. That is just walking through the assembly, trying to read through a little bit of reverse engineering um, and learning a little bit more of the x86 architecture and uh, instruction set. So if you didn't know everything this, like, this, this code was doing, that's okay. It was meant to be well commented and meant to talk you through it. And then obviously you can Google and research some things around. I probably sped through this a little bit and I hope it wasn't too hard to follow. Um, but I wanted to focus on getting these questions answered and actually getting us the flag. So 
reverse engineering and assembly is a weird and hard thing, but uh, don't ever be afraid to simply Google even the like smallest, most minute thing, because that is important for actually solving reverse engineering challenges and understanding assembly. So, super cool. Quick shout out to the people that support me on Patreon. Thank you guys so much. It is incredible to see this list growing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I cannot say it enough. $1 a month on Patreon will give you a special shout out just like this at the end of every video. $5 or more on Patreon will give you early access to everything that I release on YouTube before it goes live. Because I like to record things in bulk, hopefully, usually, when I actually have motivation and time that's kind of at a premium these days. Uh, that way you can get everything right when it's recorded, right when it's ready to go. You don't have to wait until YouTube will gradually upload them or release them. So, just $5 a month. Hope it's not too much. Thanks. Hey, if you did like this video, please do like, comment, and subscribe. It helps grow the channel. Um, if you're willing to support me on Patreon, link in the description, that'd be awesome. Please do join our Discord server. It's a cool community full of CTF players, programmers, and hackers. If you want to hang out with me or other cool people, that's the best place to do it. We like to form up when a CTF or a competition is going on. I think we're going to have Seesaw Red and Pico CTF, uh, and we are just got a really good CTF camp. Uh, cool place to just jam with people that like war games and that whole scene, programming, cybersecurity, etc. Please do come hang out. Hope to see you on Patreon. Hope to see you in the next video. Love you guys. Bye.